up so that the speaker can uh, respond to them. And we move on to the second talk by Jana Lasser from Graz University of Technology on calibrating school models to cluster tracing data. Uh, All right, let me share my screen. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And see my screen. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the kind introduction and invitation. Anna, I will let you know five minutes before you are to finish so that uh, you know that how much time you have. Okay. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm actually quite quite happy uh, about the preceding talk because it introduced many of the concepts that I will also need in my talk so I can uh, be a bit quicker there. So my talk will be specifically about calibrating school models such as the one as we just saw uh, to cluster tracing data to make sure that our models reflect reality as closely as possible. Um, so uh, first of all, let me walk you through um, the basic components of the approach and the model we are working with. We are also using an agent-based model of um, SARS-CoV-2 spread in schools, which is composed of, first of all, a model of the infection in an individual, um, oops. then a, a contact network model of the school or schools, to be more precise. On top of that, we can sprinkle a number of interventions, such as wearing masks, regular screen testing, cohorting classes, or ventilation. And then, of course, there is the calibration step where uh, we tune the parameters of, of our model such that it reflects the observations in reality as closely as possible. And this calibration step is what most of my talk will be about. But first, let me go briefly over the other components so you can understand how it all works together a bit better. Um, the model of the infection in the individual in our model is, is closely tied to uh, kind of an approximation of the viral load in an individual. So we start out with a susceptible individual um, at, the, at day zero at the transmission, the individual becomes um, exposed and as the viral load increases, the individual becomes infectious and then either stays asymptomatic or becomes symptomatic. And then again, after a few days, the individual recovers and ceases to be infectious. And uh, since we uh, want to incorporate quarantine uh, in our model, we also have each of these states in a quarantine version where the agent simply doesn't have any contacts to other agents anymore. And the transition periods between these individual agent states are drawn from uh, distributions for these uh, epidemiological parameters, which we know, thankfully, from literature for the various virus variants that we are dealing with. Now, uh, the contact networks of our schools um, we actually did not have empirical data for, for that for schools in Austria. And I was quite happy to see that this uh, exists in, in France. Uh, we nevertheless found a workaround to still come up with, uh, with proper co-location co networks in our schools. Um, we made use of the fact that schools are highly, highly organized environments that uh, have kind of laws and timetables governing how they function. And we used information from the National School Statistics of Austria uh, that gave us information on the average class sizes for different school types, the average number of classes and the average number of teachers, as well as uh, teaching timetables um, to figure out uh, how many different teachers are, are teaching a given class. And then we also conducted a series of interviews with teachers and principals to kind of make sure that our assumptions about how this uh, contact structure in the school looks like are, uh, are based in reality and also to adapt for any changes that uh, might have happened due to um, how they were dealing with the pandemic. So um, what you can see here is uh, the agents in our model, in red, the students organized in these circles, which uh, symbolize the classes and in blue, the teachers. And then we add contacts uh, to, to all these nodes um, based on the reality in, in the school. So based on all the uh, different interactions that happen in the school that, that cause two agents to have a contact with each other. For students, we have um, three types of contacts. Um, first of all, we uh, have siblings. Um, we chose to include this specifically because in Austria, schools really go to great lengths to enable children from the same household to go to the same school if it fits uh, age-wise. And these uh, contacts are household contacts, so the transmission risk is probably quite high there. And uh, these are contacts that would enable a transmission to jump quickly between classes, so we explicitly incorporated those. Then, of course, students can be classmates and have a contact there. 
uh, students can be daycare mates. These are all the orange uh, connections that span between classes because we learned to our surprise that even under pandemic conditions during daycare classes were mixed. They were not kept in the class groups. Uh, so this caused a number of, of connections between classes as well. Then teachers obviously also have contacts amongst each other, either through, for example, jointly teaching or supervising a group of students, uh, being acquaintances um, next to work or just having work meet meetings. And then on top of that, there are all the connections between teachers and students, which are caused by a teacher teaching a class or supervising a daycare group. Now, what I show you here is a contact network of a typical Austrian primary school with afternoon daycare. It has eight classes and every class has on average 19 students. Um, this, uh, for comparison, is the contact network of an Aus average Austrian secondary school. And you can uh, appreciate that it looks very different. Um, first of all, there are way more students, uh, way more classes. Uh, way more teachers and way more contacts between teachers and students because uh, several teachers are teaching the same class, whereas in primary students only one teacher is uh, mostly teaching a, a given class. And this already um, hints at the necessity of modeling school types with different contact networks to kind of appreciate the organizational differences in the different school types. So in summary, we model a total of six different school types, which are the most prevalent school types in Austria. We have primary schools for students aged six to 10, also with afternoon daycare, then lower secondary schools for students aged uh, 10 to 15, again with daycare, upper secondary schools for ch uh, children aged 15 to 18, and then the secondary schools for children uh, aged 10 to uh, 18. And due to our education system, uh, yeah, these uh, school types kind of coexist with uh, the upper secondary and low lower secondary schools. Well, and each of these school types uh, is quite different in terms of the average number of classes it has, the average number of students per class and the average number of teachers. Um, and this is incorporated in our contact networks. All right, now um, to simulate how the infection is transmitted or spreads throughout the school, we basically have to answer three questions. First question is, do agents meet? Then is one of the agents infectious? And the last question, whether there is a transmission between the agents or not. The first question is answered by our dynamic contact network. And I say dynamic here because uh, the contact networks I just showed you depict a weekday and during weekends, we remove all the contacts that are caused by the school and we only keep the, uh, the household contacts. Then the question of whether one of the agents is infectious or not is answered by the dynamics of the infection in the agent itself. And to answer the question of whether there is a transmission or not, we perform a Bernoulli trial with a probability P of an infection happening, uh, which is modified by a number of parameters. Now let me dig deeper into this because this is where the magic happens. This is also where we need to start with our calibration. So um, this, what you see here, is the equation for the, for the probability P of a transmission happening. Um, we have a so-called base transmission risk beta, which is equivalent to the household transmission risk between two adults, which is then modified by a number of, of other parameters, which are the cues in this equation. We have a modification, a reduction of transmission risk due to a contact being a school contact. We assume that it's likely to have a lower transmission risk than a household contact. Then we modify the transmission risk based on the age of the transmitting agent and the age of the agent being infected. Okay. Um, and then we have a modification uh, due to infection progression. So we, we assume that agents are more infectious at the beginning of the infection and then uh, progressively the transmission risk um, decreases. And we also have a modification depending on whether the agent has symptoms or not. Asymptomatic agents have a lower transmission risk. Now, um, the last two uh, modifications we can thankfully take from the literature, but the first four parameters are three parameters in our model and need to be calibrated so our model reflects what happens in reality. Um, now, before I dive into how we performed the cal calibration, let me quickly introduce you to the data we used to calibrate. 
Um, thankfully, we got a um, quite uh, fine-grained data set of uh, clusters, uh, outbreaks that occurred in Austrian schools by the um, Austrian Agency for, for Food and Health, uh, the Argus, and which produced these uh, cluster tracing data in cooperation with the local health authorities. We have a total of 536 clusters over different school types with a, a bit over 3,300 3, cases. And for every um, infection case in every cluster, we know the age of the, uh, of the infected person. For every cluster, we know the source case. And for every um, infected person, we also know whether or not they were asymptomatic or not. And then we uh, group these uh, clusters, to, we assign them to the different school types based on the age of the involved agents. Uh, so everything that involves only uh, adults and children under 10 years is primary, uh, and lower secondary, uh, upper secondary and secondary, and everything that couldn't be assigned to a school type based on one of these rules, uh, we label otherwise uh, inconclusive, and we don't use this um, in the further calibration, but I still report them, the numbers here. Um, all right, from this, uh, we can um, work out the cluster size distributions for the different school types. Um, we can see that for uh, primary, lower secondary and upper secondary schools, cluster sizes uh, are um, on average smaller. Whereas for secondary schools and also this inconclusive share of the clusters, we get um, comparatively much larger outbreaks. And this uh, distribution of cluster sizes is actually one of the two um, main things we're going to calibrate our model to, to um, reproduce these, these cluster size distributions. Um, the second uh, type of information we get from this data is um, the uh, share of student source cases, so who actually introduced the cluster into the school. Uh, that you can see to the left, and we can see that for um, primary schools, uh, there's almost no students introducing the infection into the schools, almost uh, all teachers, whereas for upper secondary schools, it's almost all students that introduce the infection into the school. And the same uh, information we have um, for the share of students that are uh, infected in each cluster, and here we can see that in primary schools, uh, only about three quarters of the cases in every cluster are students, whereas for the upper secondary and secondary um, schools, almost all infections are students. And uh, the, the fact that students are so overrepresented here makes a lot of sense because the schools have just way more students than, than teachers, obviously. And this um, share of, uh, of students that are infected in each cluster, this is the second um, characteristic that we're going to use to calibrate our system. And then we also get the ratio of asymptomatic cases in each cluster and starts out about three quarters of, uh, of children aged below six years are asymptomatic, whereas when we are in the adult age range, this drops to about one quarter. And these numbers are comparatively low to what we know um, for asymptomatic infections of COVID. This is all wild type strain. Uh, and this is, I think, explained by the fact that um, the cluster, cluster tracing mechanism that uh, Austrian health authorities employ actually have follow ups. So they will identify people who were pre-symptomatic when the first contact to the health authority happened. And uh, they exclude these pre-symptomatic people that later became symptomatic in the statistic. So this really is only asymptomatic people, not pre-symptomatic. All right. And then the last piece we did in the puzzle to calibrate our model uh, is the conditions that we actually had during the time of data collection in schools. So this data was collected uh, in autumn 2020. Um, we had a basic test trace isolate protocol uh, implemented in schools where when an infection was detected, uh, the infected person was immediately isolated and uh, all the close contacts um, were, were quarantined. Namely, I think it was uh, table neighbors and in some cases also students, uh, teachers that had a closer contact to the, to the student. And then a thing that was kind of a bit special about Austria, and which I think also makes this data very valuable, is that there was rigorous testing of all the K2 contacts. So all the students in the same class and all the teachers that had contact with the students were tested. Um, so we think that there is not that much bias uh, in the that asymptomatic children uh, were not detected because we had this um, white, uh, white cast net of, of testing around an infection case. 
Then there was no mask mandates implemented in schools at the time yet. There was no uh, additional ventilation uh, and no preventive testing or class cohorting either. And there were strict measures to prevent mixing between classes, such as uh, staggered start times and kind of walking protocols in the hallways, which was even more mind boggling given the fact that the classes mixed during daycare, but apparently that didn't count. We were puzzled by this, but the uh, teachers confirmed that in the interviews. And then, uh, as I already said, uh, during that time, the original um, strain was circulating. All right. Now, our aim uh, is uh, to use this information to build a model of infection transmission in schools that reflects this data that I just showed you as closely as possible. And then we want to use this calibrated model to test the effectiveness of, of um, additional intervention measures on top of that, uh, similar to the talk you just saw. And I will just briefly touch on this in the end of my talk. So um, to calibrate the model, uh, we kind of uh, tried to um, drill or separate out the, the three parameters a bit to not uh, have uh, such a high dimensional problem that, that we needed to search. And thankfully, we could um, calibrate the household transmission risk, so this, this base uh, transmission risk beta, independently of the other three parameters, because it only depends on infection progression and symptoms. And this we could take from the literature. It doesn't depend on any school specific or age specific uh, modifications because it's just a transmission between two adults in a household. And we know that the expected uh, secondary attack rate in households uh, for the original strain was about uh, 38%. And so we just sample uh, adult individuals, um, give them uh, epidemiological parameters according to their distributions and let them infect each other. And then uh, we adjust the space transmission risk beta um, such that we, we hit this target secondary attack rate in households. And then uh, we find that in our model, beta needs to be about 7.4% uh, transmission risk per day of simulation, um, such that we will produce this secondary, secondary attack rate in households. Uh, now onto the more complicated calibration task, the remaining uh, three parameters namely the modification um, of transmission risk due to a contact being a school contact and due to the age of the transmitting and receiving agents. Um, this is more complicated because these parameters depend on each other. Um, so we, we kind of need to uh, vary them together to see the, the impact on, on the overall transmission dynamics in the school model. Uh, to make this task a little bit easier, we make one, one assumption. We assume that uh, this Q2 and Q3 uh, namely the transmission risk reduction due to the age of the transmitting and receiving agent are the same uh, and they vary together uh, and we uh, condense this into a new parameter which we simply call QH and we also make the assumption that this dependence uh, on age is linear and uh, decreases with every year that a child is younger than 18. And now um, to uh, calibrate the system, we optimize an error term, uh, which is kind of the difference between what our system produces uh, to the actual empirical data. And this error term is composed of, of two components. The first part is this difference between the cluster size distributions. And the second component is this difference between the share of infected agents. So how many students, how many teachers are infected in the cluster. Um, we weigh this by the number of empirically observed um, clusters for every school type and we sum over the different school types. And this is the overall error that we are optimizing. And then we perform simulations for all school types where we draw source cases from the known distribution of source cases between teachers and students. We use the known age dependence of asymptomatic uh, infection courses and we simulate with the known conditions in schools, namely only test trace isolate. Um, and then I uh, kind of uh, consciously left this uh, definition of difference between the uh, observed and simulated um, characteristics a bit vague because we actually tested different difference measures. We didn't want our outcome de to be dependent on the specific difference measure that we used. So we, we tested the sum of squares, uh, chi-squared distribution uh, difference. Uh, but the Chiara, Spearman and, and Pearson correlation and also the difference of a fit uh, to the QQ and PP uh, slope to one. And I kind of made sure that all these different distance measures uh, 
converged at a, uh, at a kind of similar point. And these um, heat maps that you can see here is simply um, varying the, this contact uh, modification uh, for a school contact and the uh, age modification together. And for each of these parameter combinations, we performed um, 4,000 simulations. And then we could determine the minimum in this plot. And as you can see, these plots are still a bit noisy. So we bootstrapped these ensembles of simulations a thousand times to kind of get a confidence interval around the minimum. And this is uh, what, what we find. So um, we, we see that for all the different distance measures, we kind of get a convergence of this uh, contact um, modification at around the third. Uh, it, it, uh, all of the, the distance measures, uh, confidence intervals overlap, we eventually decided to go for the sum of squares as a distance measure. And uh, same picture for this age modification, uh, where we also, also see that the difference measures give us uh, kind of similar results. We also pick the sum of squares for the sake of simplicity. And so the final outcome is that uh, the contact rate is about uh, 0.3, um, which means that a school contact is the transmission risk for a school contact is about a third the transmission risk of a household contact. And for the age dependence, we get uh, minus 0 0.005, which means that per year, a child is younger than 18. Um, the transmission and infection risk is reduced by about half a percent. So a child that is six years old will have a 6% lower transmission risk than a child that is 18 years old which is uh, not that much. All right, um, I see that I'm almost out of time, so I will quickly um, uh, brush over this. What we then did with this model was very similar to what you just saw. We tested different intervention measures, preventive testing, masking, ventilation, reduced class sizes, and we could see uh, for every school type, we could get these outbreak distributions depending on who introduced the infection to the school. And then we could um, put different measure combinations on top of that and see how the outbreak distributions um, developed. And then we made a recommendation uh, for, for measures that were needed in different school types to kind of control the outbreak sizes, uh, keep the average um, reproduction number below one. Uh, and these, these measures were then actually implemented in Austrian schools. And this was now only relevant for, for the Delta period. These, these results are for Delta. Uh, but yeah, that was quite uh, quite nice that um, we could find some very actionable results uh, that were then also implemented. Uh, yeah, same for secondary schools. The, the main outcome here is that secondary schools need more measures than primary schools because there are more contexts there. It makes a lot of sense, and that for Delta at least, uh, the combination of a combination of three different measures was sufficient to control outbreaks in secondary schools, whereas in primary schools you only needed two. And that's already it. Uh, this is the, the collection of materials. We have one publication about the, uh, the school study in, in nature communications and the second one where we used the same calibration, but this time for spread in the university contact network, which was just accepted yesterday. And I also want to thank uh, the team that contributed to this, uh, Peter Klimek, uh, first and foremost, who is also here today. Uh, there's a simulation package associated with the simulation that is free to use. Uh, data is also open. And if you're interested, the slides uh, are here and I also posted them in the chat. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jana. Maybe we have time for a couple of uh, very quick questions. And um, I do not see any questions in the chat. Maybe I can ask you a question. I'm a bit ashamed. I think like all your talk was about estimation and I did